Welcome to Dorsey's Bank Council Roundtable on LIBOR Update, CCPA Class Actions and Standing Requirements. I'd like to introduce Tom Kelly, a partner in Dorsey's Finance and Restructuring Group. Tom? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our April 2021 Bank Council Roundtable. This month, we're going to cover two topics. First, we're going to hear more about the long lingering death of LIBOR. And on that topic, uh, we will get presentations from Joe Liniak, who is a partner in our finance and restructuring group, focusing on the regulatory side. Betsy Parker, also a partner in finance and restructuring, who uh, is primarily in the commercial lending area. And Jim Langdon, who is a partner in our trial group. Um, after a quick break at halftime to provide the super secret number, we will move into the California Consumer Protection Act class actions um, presentation that will be presented by Bob Katanaw, who's a partner in our trial group, um, Ken Schmidt, also a partner in our trial group, and Melanie Jordan, who's an associate in our labor and employment group. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Liniak. Oh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, uh, by the way, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, the day's program is 60 minutes. Uh, materials will be sent out to you uh, if they've not already been sent out and will be available on our website. Uh, and uh, because of the fact that this is just completely crammed in of, of, of a lot of material that we hope is helpful, uh, we may not have time for questions, but certainly feel free to uh, to ask them. And if we have time, we will do so or we will get back to you. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, Tom's already gone over the agenda, so let's jump in. Next slide, please. Uh, the LIBOR update. Next slide, please. Okay, um, now, by the way, the discussion on LIBOR today is going to be recent developments, and, and we have got some extensive LIBOR information, which we have been pushing out to our clients and friends over the last several years, and that material is actually still available on our website if somebody needs a, a refresher course. But um, a couple of initial thoughts, uh, LIBOR is not going quietly. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board and ARC uh, have finally realized that trying to make it up out of whole cloth is not working very well. Um, and um, I, I will tell you why I'm a, I'm a criticism of, uh, critic of this entire process. And I've got to ask a couple of questions. Uh, who in the name of God have appointed the ARC as boss? And do we want a foreign agency dictating this critical factor to the US financial services industry? And just getting into, the, into a little bit greater detail, We've got the Federal Reserve Board driving, uh, driving the bus. It's a governmental agency with absolutely no authority to mandate contracting between private parties. Uh, and actually, it only, re it only uh, regulates very few banks, yet they're in charge. Kind of curious. Plus, uh, the, the acronym of BOGSAT, you may be aware of it. It's a group of guys and girls sitting around a table and making stuff up. Uh, and, and in this case, it's they represent primarily on uh, drafters on the derivatives and swaps uh, arena, which is separate from what, mo most of what we're going to be talking about today. That collectively created somewhere between two and five hundred trillion dollars of defectively drafted instruments that they're now trying to fix. Uh, why they're put in charge, I'm not quite sure, but. Um, uh, they're both making believe that they've got some sort of authority, and I think that's a critical element that can come to haunt us down the line. Plus, we have got a foreign entity, a foreign governmental entity, holding the power to affect the U.S. financial services industry by addressing and mandating requirements of LIBOR and the, um, and the elimination of LIBOR. Uh, litigation, I think as a result of several of these factors, which we're going to be exploring today, litigation is most is almost certain in most market segments. And I, I, I think one admonition for, for our bank clients and friends is you've got to make up your own mind about who it is you're going to believe and what it is you're going to follow. And I think Betsy is going to be talking about drafting issues. You've got the derivatives and swap, swaps markets, which overwhelm everything else. 
you've got commercial lending and consumer lending, which is really, consumer lending is primarily in mortgages um, where, uh, where LIBOR uh, occurs. Uh, new originations going forward and renewals of existing agreements where you're able to modify defective replacement language is not the problem. It's the legacy documents that are a concern where modification will not be uh, uh, necessary uh, available. The absence or perhaps of LIBOR replacement language, the inadequacy of replacement language, and the absence, and this is an important one, of margin substitution authority, because you may be able to have, you know, there may be language to substitute the, uh, the benchmark, but not necessarily the margin. And what's occurred here, and this is something that I think Jim is going to discuss in greater depth, we've uh, the the ARC and the um, uh, and the Federal Reserve Board has create have created in uh, several cases uh, dual versions or other uh, additional versions of the same benchmark, um, which might apply depending upon the document or the counterparties to the particular transaction or both. So what we have right now is so far. And we've got the potential of margin adjusted sulfur. We've got forward looking sulfur, which may be created. We have synthetic LIBOR. And by the way, LIBOR itself over the last decade has been synthetic. So now it's a synthetic computation of a, itself, synthetic benchmark. And then we've got ambiguities on the replacement events as to when the replacement events will, uh, will, will occur, which means you're really going to have to take a look at this and try to figure out what works for you and your bank. And in addition, the announced holy grail or, uh, of SOFR has not been embraced by the financial services industry. Uh, and, it, uh, and, the, and one of the main reasons is that the SOFR lacks a credit component, which is a significant concern. And that means that a lot of banks, particularly treasury officials who are concerned about yield, have looked at other benchmarks to substitute for their credit in their credit agreements, such as a Maribor, in order to be able to avoid this problem. So again, there's a lot of things which are occurring here and a lot of announcements which are taking place, which you're gonna have to really start to follow. Uh, and um, let's go on to uh, recent developments. We're gonna talk a little bit about ICE developments and uh, uh, the FCA developments, ARC pronouncements, federal agency announcements, New York state legislation, and possibly federal legislation. Um, let's go on to the next one. Uh, uh, now, recently uh, there was a um, replacement index uh, event, which was announced by the FCA and by, and, by, uh, and by ICE, which is the entity that computes LIBOR. Uh, I will note to you that uh, as part of it, they came up with a fact sheet, uh, which the, you can give to your customers. It has to be modified because it talks about British, uh, British values and benchmarks, but it's a pretty good document and I would, uh, uh, I would uh, uh, recommend it to you. However, as part of the announcement about the fact that certain tenors of LIBOR are going away, the FCA said, yes, this is gonna happen unless we change our minds and then it's not going to happen. And by the way, we may we may uh, require the uh, the use of a uh, computation of a synthetic version of LIBOR, but you can't use it. On the other hand, maybe we will let certain categories of folks use it. Very very helpful information. Thanks a whole lot for your help, folks. Next page, please. Uh, and and this is what this is what we really have to uh, to deal with. Uh, ICE announced that five tenors of US LIBOR are gonna be now continuing to June 30th, 2023, as opposed to July, uh, uh, January 1st, 2022. So we've got a reprieve. And these were the most important uses. There are two tenors of LIBOR, which are gonna be expiring at the end of this year, one week US LIBOR and two month US LIBOR. Now, why, why did this happen? What was the delay? Well, for one thing, I think throughout the entire financial services system, there's been an inertia which has addressed this point where people have just not been able to get around to be doing things properly. But then there's a recognition that, you know, this is a really complex thing we're dealing with. 
because we're talking about systems modifications and clearly the systems modifications are not completed yet. You've got to do a lot of work to see what, what systems, particularly proprietary systems, um, talk with each other. And then in addition, what they're also finding is that uh, outside of the United States, outside of Europe, there are a lot of other folks in other nations that utilize LIBOR for purposes of uh, for payments and for accounting. And they're now saying, wait a minute, we need to do catch up. And so you not only have got a US and European, but you've got a global uh, issue coming up uh, that, that's in development. And, and lo and behold, we find out that yes, indeed, we can uh, delay most of the LIBOR issues uh, for at least another, another uh, year. Now, the problem though, is whether or not as a result of inertia, people have now said, well, we don't have to worry about it till next year when you put it on the back burner. That may not necessarily be a good idea. Next page, please. Uh, a couple of other things, and these are good, useful documents to take a look at. The, um, uh, we've got here the place where you can find the ARC information. Uh, the fact that the ARC has got a forward-looking, uh, is proposing a forward-looking SOFR uh, as opposed to a backward-looking SOFR. Uh, a information which is absolutely must reading for those of you who are in the, uh, uh, the ABS uh, uh, line of work on uh, new language and use of, uh, use of the SOFR for ABS transactions. Uh, now the, uh, the ARC issued a transition event statement. I will note to you that they talked about a benchmark transition event, which does not necessarily line up totally with the New York definition of a benchmark transition event. They call it a LIBOR discontinuous event. And anytime you're talking about cross purposes, our friends like Jim Langdon will realize that that's something that folks would probably be willing to litigate over. Um, and um, let's go on to the next, next slide, please. A couple of quick things to talk about before I turn it over to uh, Betsy. Banking agency announcements. Uh, the banking agencies have basically been cheerleaders and saying everybody really should stop using LIBOR. Uh, they have now begun to issue in, uh, guidelines for examination by their uh, by the examiners, which means that you're probably going to start getting beat up if you haven't already stopped using LIBOR. Pretty good idea because they are now saying, wait a minute, not use uh, if you're if you if you have not stopped using LIBOR, that's probably a safety and soundness issue, which uh, is always uh, the death knell of making you stop doing whatever it is they don't like you doing. Mentioned to you that. HUD has now indicated for HECMs that there's a limitation on using LIBOR, LIBOR coming up. And the CFPB uh, is really out in the lunatic fringe. They really have nothing whatsoever to do with this. And yet they issued, I think, their normal 400 pages of nonsense talking about um, uh, transitions from LIBOR. Again, almost useless. Guys, go do something else. This is really not your purview. But they did it anyway. Turn to the next slide, please. Uh, this is important. New York State passed legislation because everyone realized, you know what, there really is exposure here. And uh, uh, a bunch of agencies and, and made up committees without authority is gonna result in litigation. And this litigation is a site there we need to take a look at. Uh, it's got definitions, the effective LIBOR discontinuance uh, and the continuity of contract and a safe harbor of importance. Uh, and you can take a look at this, and I really would recommend that you take a look at this. As part of the benchmark replacement that is recommended, it can include a spread adjustment. So arguably that means that if you choose the SOFR, you can build in the spread adjustment and that is gonna be legal. And that is not, is gonna result in no liability to you if you do it. Of course, you're probably all thinking, how can you constitutionally interfere with the validity of contracts? That's something that's Jim's purview. And we will be talking about that, I'm sure, as the litigation proceeds. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, there's the possibility of federal legislation because everyone is realizing, well, wait a minute, even though in many cases we use New York law, there may be litigation elsewhere, and there, we may not be using New York law in many, many contracts. Also true, there may be different venues that may apply New York law and require 
interpretation of New York law and, uh, uh, and so forth. And they have now started the process of looking at whether or not there can be a, uh, uh, a United States safe harbor for substitution of LIBOR. And it generally follows what was done in New York. It's a little bit different, but uh, this certainly is gonna be something that is gonna be negotiated on a, uh, over the next couple of months, leading up to hopefully something that can, that can help us all. Uh, now, uh, having said all of that and indicated how cynical I am about the process, Betsy is gonna talk about the practical sides of dealing with it uh, as counsel uh, representing lenders in uh, negotiating and changing these terms and conditions. Turn it over to you, Betsy. Thanks so much, Joe. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk with you for a few minutes now about uh, LIBOR replacement and practice as it relates specifically to lending. Uh, due to the time limitations today, uh, just know that while there are different transition deadlines for different tenors and types of LIBOR, um, I'm generally going to be speaking in reference to the June 30th, 2023 deadline uh, that relates to the one, three, and six month LIBOR. So, just know that as I'm talking about upcoming deadlines, there's a little asterisk whenever I'm speaking about that, and uh, that's what that asterisk would mean. Uh, the first thing to talk about is, is new loans. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, uh, but I'll just say that, you know, just know that U.S. banking regulators have said that new LIBOR originations should end as soon as possible, uh, and in any of case, uh, by December 31st of 2021, this year. And additionally, the ARC has recommended that by June 30th of this year, so just in a couple months now, uh, that new loans should no longer be originated using LIBOR. So uh, as we've been seeing over the last couple of months, and as I'm sure you've been seeing as well, this means that lending institutions have been rolling out their new mandatory LIBOR replacement, um, well, not LIBOR replacement, but the language that will replace LIBOR, uh, which in many instances is so for um, and, you know, as we're working through this, obviously there will be some hiccups as we're implementing new language, determining, you know, which provisions are maybe pressure points that will have a little bit of negotiations between the parties, et cetera. Uh, but uh, that part should be the easy part, hopefully, uh, of making this transition. So uh, if, if you're doing a new loan, you don't need to really consider all of the things I'm about to say next. So that brings me to the second category of loans, which are legacy loans. Uh, so these are loans that are already in existence that currently have a LIBOR interest rate. Uh, Joe spoke earlier about the death dates. I'm not going to speak to those now, uh, but there has been uh, a fair amount of good news on this front over the last several months. Uh, first of all, we have more time, so that's certainly always a good thing. Uh, second of all, we have more certainty. Uh, the IBA and FCA announcements of March 5th, that that was the benchmark transition event, uh, as it's called in the ARC proposed language, and as many may perhaps have in their own loan documentation. That's the event that we've all kind of been anticipating uh, for our loan documents. So with the occurrence of that event, the spread adjustment for SOFR was fixed as of that date. So we now also know what the spread adjustment is going to be for the various tenors. So, with that certainty comes another good thing, uh, which is that we now also have simplified LIBOR replacement language to use. On March 25th, the ARC put forth new guidance uh, with supplemental uh, simplified LIBOR replacement language down to a mere four pages, uh, down from I think six or so was uh, what was in the predecessor. So still pretty lengthy for a short agreement, uh, but uh, certainly heading in the right direction, and I'm sure that there's some language in there that can be modified, stripped out, made less verbose uh, for those shorter agreements that we're all working with at times. So what should we know about replacement language? Well, I've put together a top five list. We haven't really delved into the replacement language itself on these calls, so I thought now would probably be a good time now that we have so much more certainty than we have in the past. So I put together a top five list for us to go through these. Uh, but please remember these terms, uh, the concepts I'm talking about, these all relate to the way that the language appears in the ARC hardwired fallback language. 
When you're considering your own loan, please do bear in mind that every loan will have its own circumstances, its own tax, and you'll need to consult those. Uh, I know some banks have adopted the language verbatim, others have uh, made modifications, changed defined terms, et cetera. So uh, what I'm about to say all relates to the ARC model language as well. So top five, um, I suppose technically I should be counting down from five, but I'm gonna start with one. Um, in no particular order as well. Uh, because the benchmark transition event has occurred, we no longer need to identify the multiple events that could trigger it. So instead, the new language includes a statement of fact that notes that uh, the FCA and the IBA announcements have occurred. It notes the pending cessation of LIBOR uh, for the various LIBOR tenors and goes on to note uh, that uh, on the earlier of an early opt-in effective date, or the date that those uh, tenors are no longer representative, which we now know to be generally June 30th of 2023, the benchmark replacement will automatically replace the existing benchmark. As you may recall, the early opt-in can be initiated by the lender, but the borrower has a veto power uh, in its objection rights. So if a lender wants to switch over before that June 30th date, uh, it can do so, but it needs to have the borrower be in agreement. Um, number two, um, well, I guess I'll speak a little bit here. I think I have a little time. Um, so one aside, uh, the FCA, uh, as Joe kind of mentioned, uh, once granted the power to do so, may compel the IBA to continue to publish LIBOR on a synthetic basis after that June 30th date. So um, you might wonder, well, how does this affect me? Well, the synthetic LIBOR would be A, limited to use in narrow circumstances, and B, would not be considered to be a representative rate. Uh, and so therefore it's expected that the June 30th date would in most cases be the transition date. Uh, there would be exceptions to that, but generally that's the expectation at this point. Uh, number two, the ARC language provides modified language around what the benchmark replacement will be. So most notably, it now includes the actual amount of the spread that will be used when transitioning from um, one, three, or six month LIBOR. As I said earlier, now that we have more certainty, they've actually built that certainty into the text. Uh, the waterfall for the replacement has term SOFR as the first option and daily simple SOFR as the second. But the guidance also provides alternative language if a different uh, SOFR rate is one of the options that the parties said they'd like to use. Because term SOFR is generally considered to be a highly desirable option, uh, the most undesirable characteristic of it is that it does not yet exist. It's not yet available. Uh, but the expectation is that uh, there will be a satisfactory term SOFR option that may become available in the future to be used. Uh, and if that were to be the case, the parties may want to consider at this time building in some language that allows them to actually climb back up the waterfall to put in place that term SOFR language uh, when it does become available if they've already transitioned to a different uh, alternative rate. Uh, I'd like to also take a moment here to speak about alternative benchmarks. As Joe mentioned, and as we've spoken about at previous bank council roundtables, while SOFR is the rate that gets a lot of publicity, uh, certainly not all lenders, not all institutions believe that that's the right fit for them. Uh, there are many different types of capital funding structures out there, uh, and you know, a, a risk-free rate just isn't desirable for every institution. So um, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the FDIC, uh, the Office of Comptroller of the Currency, they have all uh, agreed that it's not mandated that you use SOFR. Uh, they're not endorsing SOFR specifically, and examiners aren't going to criticize banks who use um, a reference rate other than SOFR, including a credit sensitive rate. So uh, certainly those are options that are available if that's what your institution decides is appropriate. Uh, also, uh, as guidance for that, uh, you're not alone in this. If you're one of those institutions that isn't using SOFR, the LSTA recently put out um, some, what, what's called the credit sensitive rate slot in writer for fallback language. So you can look that one up. 
Uh, and it's basically language that can be built into the form language that ARC put out. And uh, it provides for a fallback to alternative rates, including Ameribor and the bank yield rate. So if your institution is one for which SOFR is not an attractive option, uh, you may want to look into um, that language and see if that will work for you. Third thing to point out, uh, replacement language has a LIBOR floor and it carries it forward exactly as it existed in the original agreement. So uh, it takes the original agreement and if you had a LIBOR basis of 25 basis points there, you will um, take your SOFR plus the spread adjustment, so don't sum up, SOFR plus the spread adjustment and apply the floor against that sum to decide whether it applies. Number four, benchmark conforming changes. Uh, lender or agent, depending on the transaction, can unilaterally make changes to the agreement called benchmark conforming changes. These are changes to reflect the technical, operational, or administrative changes. Um, as we all know, there are primary interest rate mechanics in agreements. There are also kind of secondary uh, aspects of the mechanics that are often built into uh, other provisions. And so this will kind of allow the lender to iron those out and make sure they all read correctly after the transition occurs. To help all of us in identifying what those are, uh, we can refer to those uh, LSTA exemplar credit agreements that I mentioned earlier, which are being put out for different types of SOFR. And so we can see what the appropriate language would be and translate that over to our documents and try to work that in uh, to build in for those different changes. Um, finally, number five of the top five is notice requirements. And I'll reiterate here, I'm talking about just the ARC form language, but uh, check your agreements to see if this is the case for you. There are a few circumstances where the lender or agent in a syndicated deal will need to give notice under the ARC language. The first one just happened. Uh, that was that March 5th announcement I spoke about earlier. Uh, that was the LIBOR transition event, um, benchmark transition event. Um, lenders need to send notices to borrowers about that. Uh, and LSTA put out some kind of form language for that as well um, that, could, that could be used or modified. A second notice requirement, requirement is at the time of implementation of the benchmark replacement. And the third is the notice letting the borrower know about conforming changes that were made to the credit agreement that I spoke about a minute ago. Agent, lender can make the changes, but you gotta let your borrower know what they are. You may have noticed you've heard very little about the role of a lender in a syndicated transaction. And that's because they don't have much of a role. Uh, really the only role of a lender in a syndicate for all of this is, um, unless it's an early opt-in, uh, or unless you're replacing the benchmark that replaced LIBOR, which you know, that's down the road and, and not necessarily very likely. Unless you're doing those two things, the lenders don't have a consent right. So um, if a lender is, if you're part of a transaction in a syndicate and you wanna have those rights, uh, you're gonna need to reach out to the agent about that at the time that this language is being built into your agreements and see whether you can negotiate a place at the table or not. Uh, so that's, that's the top five. I think from here, I'll hand it over to Jim Langen, Langdon to speak about some of the litigation aspects of LIBOR replacement. Thank, thank you very much, Betsy. Um, in the interest of keeping us all on time and not taking the other side's time, um, I'm going to be really brief and just say that if you heard everything that I heard uh, for, for the last half hour, there are more questions than there are answers. The answers we have are inconsistent um, and potentially contradictory. And that creates confusion uh, regarding the extent of um, the weakness of the replacement language and the comparable index language and the like, and confusion breeds um, litigation. There's gonna be a lot of it um, and I will tell you the rest of that the next time that we have an opportunity to be in front of you. Um, but uh, rest assured that um, there'll be a lot to talk about. Jim, I, I can only give you my sympathies as an appellate lawyer, you're watching that clock tick down and uh, you know, you're running out of time. We look forward to hearing more the next time. I too will try to be brief 
There's a lot happening in the space of data breaches right now, and do you report, don't you report. Uh, in order to give uh, that update, I'm gonna provide just a little bit of background. Historically, um, it's, if you're in doubt, just notify, because there was almost no downside from notifying. Uh, the different state laws created some confusion. Um, if you over notified, you might get sued. And as this was kind of evolving, the Supreme Court jumped in with the Spokio decision and it looked like we were going to have a, a relative safe harbor. So it, they were going to require plaintiffs in class actions to show Article Three standing. You have to have some concrete and particularized injury. And this is one thing that Ken's going to talk about toward the end of our program. Uh, so the next slide, please. And prior to CCPA, there was almost no meaningful downside over notification. Uh, people weren't really upset anymore about the fact that, oh yeah, one of my credit cards got breached. Uh, the phenomenon was being be called breach fatigue. Uh, if you got credit monitoring, there were no damages. Uh, for the most part, you, you weren't required to get to pay for it yourself. The entity who got hacked would give you credit monitoring um, and people ignored it. Uh, the take rate is not only less than 10%, the last few I've done is uh, two or 3%. Um, and at the same time, it's interesting that with the cat and mouse game, the plaintiff's lawyers tried to find other ways to create damages so they could, they could get in court. Next slide, please. And one of the uh, uh, ways um, that things got even more confusing was as this space matured, uh, entities began to realize they had, they had potential exposure for notifications beyond just the U.S. state notification laws. Um, for those multinationals, um, Article 33 of the GDPR uh, has a 72-hour shot clock, which is ridiculous in the sense that you don't know within 72 hours what even happened. But that you had to notify, at least under Article 33, the supervisory authority. Um, before you had to notify individuals, there was a higher bar, you had a little bit more time. Article 34 said you didn't have to individuals if there was no likelihood of significant harm to the rights or liberties of, of third parties. Now, where it got really complicated, especially in the last few months, is the New York Department of Financial Services also had a fairly similar 72-hour shot clock, uh, but it was triggered by a material or potential material impact on the organization. So any entity that's subject to NYDFS regulations had the opportunity to do a reasonable investigation and say, is this going to be a material event for us or not? And the materiality standard, as you all know, is, can be fairly significant. Unfortunately, and what, I'm not going to get into this a lot, but I'll allude to it a couple times, with the recent developments uh, in New York Department of Financial Services decisions they announced two in the last couple of weeks, uh, that would suggest we're taking a much more aggressive view of an organization's uh, obligation to report a breach. Next slide, please. It's also important uh, to recognize the role of the FDIC uh, in breach situations. As you all know, they have their own uh, uh, Section 501 rules. Uh, there's varying standards depending on the, the, whether you have to notify your examiner, notify your customers. Um, and one thing to watch out for, and this is, a, uh, I think, a real interesting development, it could be that, that if a, a bank should notify the FDIC of a possible event, that could trigger notification obligations to, to uh, New York DFS. I have not put that in the slide because I don't want to uh, create any incriminating evidence, but that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a potential disturbing development based on the last two New York DFS decisions. Uh, the other thing to keep aware of is that business contracts may require notice, uh, and that could be uh, any any different kind of trigger, and often those are extraordinarily short timelines. And just for CLE purposes, uh, lawyers have ethical obligations to clients to notify them if there's been a compromise of their information. So the judgment calls are getting more and more challenging as various uh, regulatory entities weigh in as states are modifying the breach laws. And uh, right now, the risk of reputational damage it used to be, well, goodness, if, if, you, uh, if you didn't report, you, you'd have all sorts of reputational risk. Today, 
people are wondering, well, if we do report it, we're going to have some reputational damage. Next slide, please. So, Melanie, I think this is yours. All right. Thanks, Bob. So, as Bob mentioned, you know, state statutes are not the entire picture, but in the case of California here on the West Coast, the CCPA has certainly changed everything. Or, or did it? I mean, that's a legitimate question. Um, I think the, the best way to approach this is to frame up the issue by looking at the actual language of the statute. And it's found in uh, California Civil Code. Um, and the data breach provision that's applicable here provides that any consumer whose non-encrypted and non-redacted personal information, which of course this information includes, you know, your first initial, your last name, your account number, um, which is relevant here, and subject to an unauthorized access and exfiltration, and that and is going to be important when we um, discuss this a little bit later. And of course, there's theft and disclosure involved as well, as a result of a business's violation of its duty to implement um, reasonable safety measures triggers uh, the consumer's right, if you will, to pursue a civil action against the organization to recover um, damages. And so as we note here on this slide, there's the automatic statutory damages that the consumer may pursue. Um, and there's actually a range here. It starts at $100 per individual per breach, um, and it can increase to no greater than $750 for um, per individual for any breach as well. And so this, the, when the CCPA was enacted, a lot of practitioners felt that this language then would create this, this flood or this landslide of litigation, particularly in the banking in, um, industry. Um, but for a number of reasons that we've seen, particularly as it relates to COVID and its effect on the courthouse, um, in terms of it moving through the document, we're not seeing that flood, but we also think that it's tied to a lot of ambiguities that plaintiffs are testing, but courts haven't really been quick to flesh that out. For example, one of the issues that we're seeing here is whether that statutory penalty of the 100 versus the 750 um, penalty here, does that provide enough standing? And that issue has not been fleshed out yet. We've been tracking the, the cases um, coming from this specific provision for data breaches, and we've not seen that answered. Of course, the plaintiff's bar has aggressively pursued these claims. Um, we've seen a lot of, um, of the plaintiffs push this issue with regards to the any consumer. Well, this statute applies to California consumers. And so we've seen claims from uh, uh, plaintiffs everywhere, to be quite honest. But with respect to standing, we're also seeing, you know, organizations push back and say, what exactly, um, you know, is, is the plaintiff allowed to recover here? And of course, the breach notification piece of this all creates, um, you know, a significant number of California residents who will seek a class action, but whether they will be able to pass that threshold action of standing, that's going to be something that we're looking for courts to resolve, hopefully this year um, or next, if we can move to the next slide. So why aren't we seeing more class actions? Well, um, you know, this is a question that I uh, alluded to in the first, uh, I guess, or the previous slide. Again, some of it is COVID related. A lot of it has to do with, um, uh, I guess, the standing issues. But some of it's create. I guess, some of this is triggered by the actual technicalities that are implicated here. So we have um, hackers, and you know, first we would see them target, you know, your personal information, your personal health information, your personal financial information. Um, and then once these hackers attempted this, you've got this. Um, breach notification that's kind of prompted, if you will. And of course, once you notify such a large number of people, and I think in California, there's additional layers um, of obligations that are triggered once you have to notify 500 more or more consumers, that would then trigger these putative classes here. But the ability to survive standing, that's being tested through, um, I guess, by organizations through motions to dismiss. More commonly, we're seeing this through the 12B6 standard, um, and we're seeing it more specifically, and Kent will address this more in a little bit, but we're seeing this more specifically as it relates to the CCPA being used as a predicate claim for unfair competition law claims. And so it's more uh, related to the UCL's um, unlawful prong, and they're saying, well, if you violated the CCPA, well, now you've violated the UCL. 
well, we don't know if that net, if that actually uh, jives to be quite honest, um, because we're wondering what is the actual injury that's at play here. Um, if you recall the language of the CCPA focuses on um, an unlawful access and exfiltration. It's both of those per the language, but a lot of plaintiffs are just bringing class actions or putative class, excuse me, um, because their information has been accessed. But we haven't seen courts really flesh out whether there's an exfiltration component that needs to be satisfied as well. And so attackers have evolved um, past all of this. They no longer care about your actual information. The return on investment for them is much better when they're utilizing ransomware. And so we'll turn to the next slide to discuss that. Now, the emergence of ransomware um, as the crime of choice has completely changed the landscape as well. You know, before we used to see these initial demands, um, and they were of nuisance value less than $10,000. Um, but, you know, clients have figured out that it's easier just to pay that than to restore via the backup. But now that the market price for the ransom has increased, victims have resisted and thinking, oh, this is beyond the nuisance value. And so now they're relying more so on backup to restore the information. And so as the market price has increased, the criminals have evolved as well. Their, their acumen has increased. Now they're um, trying to grab the data before organizations can lock it down. And they then threaten to release the, uh, the data. And sometimes they'll even leak a portion of it on the dark web to maximize that leverage. So the question for us becomes, well, does this typical ransomware attack trigger the state notification obligations, particularly for the CCPA? Um, there's a lot of questions that we ask in this regard. You know, first for the PPI or PII, excuse me, um, has it been exfiltrated? Again, looking at that exfiltrated piece versus it just being an unauthorized access. And then how do we know if the information has been accessed? What is the real risk of harm to the individual? We've seen some court cases really wrestle with that. Is there real harm if someone just accesses it as opposed to taking your information and then using it? And to get more into the UCL part of it, you know, is there harm when, uh, or the harm being defined as a loss of money or loss of property? Well, has money been lost? Has property been lost just by accessing your information? And that's not to minimize uh, the seriousness of a breach, but these are real questions that organizations should be asking. And then finally, does the notification uh, require the is is the notification required if the hacker just encrypts the system? Um, if some of the data was exported, but we can't tell what it was, is our obligation to trigger then? What if the hacker certifies destruction of the data as well? What do organizations do here? These are some of the questions that will need to be fleshed out as we move forward. If we can move to the next slide, and you know the Treasury Office or excuse me, the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control, it really complicates this issue a little further. You note here on this language, it says that companies that facilitate ransomware payments to cyber actors on behalf of victims, including financial institutions, cyber insurance firms, and companies involved in digital forensics and incident response, well, does that mean us? They risk violating these OFAC regulations. You know, when when organizations violate these regulations, they face strict liability for civil fines. So we, we are noting here that coordinating with the FBI may help mitigate this issue and compromises for confidentiality of the decision process may help as well. And the next slide and final slide that I'll speak to, um, if we move to the next slide, does this ransomware point two change the equation, this, this evolution of the ra uh, ransomware help us? Well, typically very little data is actually exfiltrated. Again, going back to that standard of um, unauthorized access and exfiltration. The attacker doesn't want to be detected, detected because um, or before the malware is deployed and detection systems al alert is often based on some anomalies here. The ransomware attackers have no interest in the actual content of the data as well. And we wonder, does the promise to delete the data once the ransom is paid really mean anything? Um, and so I think Bob will kind of piggyback off of that as well for the next slide. So the, the, the challenge uh, for the, the decision of do we or don't we report is really getting complex. And uh, as everyone knows, it's made in sort of the crucible of this uh, crisis of 
a, a security problem. Ransomware is the most pernicious right now, and, and uh, the, the hackers will give you a shot clock that's harder than any state notification shot clock. So uh, there's all these parallel equations that we are trying to solve uh, at the same time. Just a couple of, of uh, data points. Let's talk about is there's no risk of harm. Uh, we're going to talk about in a second the Blackbaud case, but let's assume that you, you really, in good faith, believe that there's no risk of, of harm to anybody here. Well, that's not enough necessarily for you to reach that conclusion. You may have to check with the regulatory authority. Just as an example, Florida says you can you can reach that conclusion and decide not to notify, but you have to check with law enforcement. Uh, finding someone that will even talk to you in these circumstances is not an easy thing, but that's what Florida says. Um, there's, there's no question that if you err on the side of over-reporting, you know, you're, you're not doing any favors to the individuals whose data has been compromised. You're just putting them under stress. Um, you may have to report to your business partners because you've got a very short clock, strike clock. What are they going to do? Uh, if you're if you're a bank that does business with for, with other banks, um, then you have an FDIC obligation to at least talk with your examiner. You have to tell some of the other banks that their information may have been compromised as well, and then they have an uh, obligation to it. So it gets very complex, and and looming over all of this is you're going to get a class action in California if you have a data breach involving a lot of California uh, residents. Um, now, in theory. If you don't report, you make the wrong call, you, you face the risk of enforcement. Um, I think I'm reasonably <clears throat> up to date. I've never seen a state sue somebody for not reporting promptly. But New York Department of Financial Services is now bringing enforcement actions in the form of consent orders to say, you should have told us more quickly. And if you're a financial institution and you have a problem, you go to your examiner and you say, we may have a problem, we're checking it out. The examiner says, thank you very much. You haven't triggered the obligation to notify your customers yet, but you, what, what does that do to you about your notification from New York EFS? Um, next slide, please. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the black bottom hack, but the, 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 the example is this. Initially, <clears throat> Blackbaud, the vendor, told its customers, hey, we think we're, you know, you're good. We had to pay a ransom. Um, they took her, you know, they locked us up, we paid the ransom. They guaranteed it was destroyed. And so we don't think you have an obligation to report to your own individual customers. And the, the, the initial way was people didn't report. Next slide, please. And then things got more complicated. Uh, well, it turns out that maybe the hacker leaked some of the information on the dark web to encourage Blackbaud to pay the ransom. So now you, it, there was at least exfiltration. Uh, some customers also realized that despite what Blackbaud had initially assured, uh, they did have personally identifiable information in their data sets that Blackbaud was managing. So now they're closer and closer to that notification obligation. And then the pendulum swung within a matter of days, and we did quite a few, um, unfortunately, of, of the, the companies affected. Um, so the, the, the herd mentality was going the other way. Oh, everybody has to notify. Um, even if maybe if you looked hard, you didn't have PII. So, and, and there was, it wasn't clear you know, where some of this advice was coming from, and there wasn't a lot of discussion as among those that were compromised, but you could see people starting to notify. Next slide. And for those companies that notified and they didn't have to, they found themselves in the wrong end of the class action along with Blackwater. Um, and the, as many of you I'm sure know, the way the notifications work, they're, they're fairly prescriptive. You have to say, you, you have to take protective action, do this, do that. You could be damaged because you want to create this, this response by the people whose data has been compromised. Um, but if you don't know that there's, the harm could really come to them, you're saying some things in an abundance of caution, appropriately so. Um, but then 
Uh, if you if you say, wait a second, it wasn't as bad as we thought, try getting that case dismissed early on. So there were other reputational damages of Blackboard, but uh, uh, that that's a, a pretty good case study in how things can go wrong if you if you if you're not careful about dotting I's and crossing T's. Uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, I think, and I think this is the last one. Uh, publicly traded companies have to be particularly uh, careful, even though you can protectively notify confidentially the FDIC uh, or even New York DFS or some confidential portal. Um, now, arguably, the company's on notice. Its executives are on notice. Um, it's maybe not everybody's incident response plan to quickly enforce a trading blackout. You may have business partner notifications. So it's, it's it, all these other things are at play while you're in the middle with a 72 hour shot clock trying to figure out what really happened. So uh, uh, like, like Jim said, we, we, we may have more for you as things evolve, uh, but it, I'm, I'm gonna turn it now over to Kent. But coming back to, the, to what Melanie said, this is really important. I think a lot of people thought with the advent of statutory damages in California, standing is no longer an issue. But just because there's a statutory fine doesn't mean the plaintiff has suffered concrete and particularized injury for purposes of Article Three standing. So Ken, tell us about what we have coming up to, uh, to educate us. Uh, we've discussed a very scary topic in these last uh, 20 minutes uh, in particular. Uh, data breach is a topic that uh, can make the hair uh, stand on the back of your neck. Um, and of the many participants in the parade of horribles that data breaches bring, in addition to regulatory actions and investigation and so forth, um, is uh, the class action, which has already been alluded to. Um, class actions can, in the long term, be far more consequential to a company's bottom line than fines and other regulatory uh, costs associated with regulatory action. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to weigh in on an issue that is going to be of particular importance to data breach cases, even though, as we shall see, it is not a data breach case. It is a case that arises from uh, a, a regulation that is of uh, great importance to um, companies in the financial services industry. Uh, and uh, the case is, of course, TransUnion versus Ramirez. It is now submitted, fully um, uh, briefed and argued. The oral arguments are, of course, available uh, online and you can listen to them. Very interesting exercise. Um, the question presented is here on your screen. And of course, Article 3 in the Constitution and Rule 23 in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, although fundamentally different, have one commonality. And that commonality is, of course, injury. Article 3 asks whether the plaintiff, whether individual or a class representative, has incurred or suffered an injury sufficient to give a district court jurisdiction over that claim and Rule 23, which governs class action, addresses whether uh, the uh, uh, claims or injuries of that particular plaintiff representative are sufficiently similar or typical of the class that uh, that class plaintiff uh, seeks to represent. And so here we're dealing with the question, as the um, question has been presented, of whether a plaintiff who has a unique and particularized injury, perhaps one that is clearly satisfies Rule 20, uh, uh, Article 3, uh, but is unique, whether that uh, is sufficient for purposes of, um, of, of Rule 23 uh, to certify the class. Let's go to the next slide. So the facts in, of Ramirez are pretty straightforward. Individual goes in to uh, purchase a vehicle, uh, lo and behold, he receives an unpleasant surprise. He's on the terrorist watch list. He's unable to buy the vehicle uh, and obviously is embarrassed. It's clearly a mistake. His name should not have been on that. He uh, seeks to represent a class that's certified. It goes all the way to a trial, $60 million, uh, including punitive damages, affirmed by our Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. Um, we, let's go to the next slide. 
It's now before the U.S. Supreme Court. And the question that's certified now is whether um, the, the question that's now presented is the case or controversy clause in the U.S. Constitution. Now, one would expect that uh, the Supreme Court had resolved uh, the primary issues relating to this particular issue um, and, and question in the Spokio decision from a few years back, uh, where the Supreme Court made clear that the injury sufficient to satisfy uh, Article 3 and Rule 23 uh, had to be concrete and particularized. But there's been a significant amount of questions and confusion as to what that is. And the lower courts, uh, the circuit courts and the district courts have been all over the map. Uh, now we're going to uh, hopefully receive a, a great deal of clarity. So let's quickly just consider the three categories of consumers um, that are in a data breach case. You have those that have clearly suffered an injury. Perhaps they've, perhaps they've been a victim of identity theft. They've had to pay for credit monitoring and they have an injury, their data has been breached. Uh, for those, it's really not a question, they at least have Article Three standing. But what about those class members who um, their data was subject to the breach, but they were never even informed of the, of the breach. I'm sorry, they, they were informed of the breach, but they haven't suffered any injury. Now they can testify that they worry about it, that they um, are concerned about it and whether that's sufficient, I, I, I think it's doubtful. Um, and the Supreme Court, I think, is going to provide some clarity on that subgroup of class representatives. It, it's also going to address the next category of class members, and that is those who um, never even knew until they received a letter from the class representatives saying, we have a class action and discovery has revealed that your data was breached and we'd like you to be uh, invited to, to, to join the party. Do those individuals have sufficient injury? And obviously this is gonna have a significant impact on the settlement amount or the uh, amount the judgment would be for a, a class action like this. Um, so we expect that the TransUnion case will provide a great deal of clarity that will be uh, particularly pertinent to these uh, data breach cases. It's also going to address, you know, uh, class uh, uh, certification issues and Article Three issues in a broad array of consumer protection uh, class action uh, litigation. So, as has been said on a number of subtopics that we've covered today, stay tuned. Uh, further developments, and I'm sure an e-update uh, will be forthcoming when the TransUnion versus Ramirez case is, is handed down uh, this term. If no one else has been charged with the responsibility of saying thank you for attending and uh, wishing you all a, a very good Friday and weekend and uh, also inviting any questions uh, relating to credit or to the substance of what has been uh, discussed, let me uh, jump in and uh, convey that message to each of you. Uh, have a great day. Thanks again for, for participating.